Yeah, so we are 15 minutes past the hour and ready to start our first session here on the Groovy track. Um, with us we have uh, Zachary Klein from OCI, uh, presenting from St. Louis in the US. And um, he will do a talk called Grails Leveling Up Your Game. And please go ahead, Zach, and I'll leave the stage. Thank you, Soren. Thank you, everyone, for joining. I hope you've been enjoying the conference so far. Uh, I certainly have been. I followed, on, I followed along with the sessions yesterday, and it was uh, fascinating and uh, an interesting platform as well. This is probably the more sophisticated uh, virtual conference that I've attended so far. So uh, let's get started. So we're going to be talking about Grails 4. Now, due to time constraints, I'm not going to be able to do quite as in-depth of, uh, of a demo that I had in mind. I may see if I can get some some... Uh, either a screencast or some content on GitHub, uh, because there's actually quite a bit of things I need to go through in the presentation just to talk about what's new in Grails 4. And we will talk about the upgrade process um, with, with in some detail and give you some tips on how to make that a more pain-free process. So uh, let's go right into it. As uh, Soren said, I'm Zachary Klein. I work for o OCI. I'm on the 2GM, so that's the Grails and Micronaut, or Groovy Grails and Micronaut team at Object Computing. And I've been doing uh, this kind of stuff for a while now. And I'm also an open source contributor, mostly to the Grails and Micronaut project. So let's look at our agenda. We're gonna talk about uh, primarily what's new in Grails 4, as well as what are the actual steps you, you need to take if you're coming from a Grails 3 application, uh, you're gonna move up to Grails 4. We're gonna talk about what has to change. We'll talk a little bit about if you're still in Grails 2 land. And every time I've given a talk on Grails, there's always folks that are still on Grails 2 or Grails 1 that are wondering what they should do. And it's not a, not as easy of a process, unfortunately, but we will talk a little bit about that. Uh, but primarily, we're going to be looking at what do you have to do to go from the last major release, uh, which is the Grails 3, to the current major release, Grails 4. We'll talk about what the Micronaut integration looks like. Uh, I believe we have talks later on today about Micronaut. Um, I'm not sure if we had any yesterday, but there's a talk coming up, a couple talks coming up that I know that are going to talk about that framework and uh, one of the cool features of Grails 4 is the Micronaut integration. So we'll talk about that and then we'll finally wrap things up with a summary and some time for questions, hopefully. So a quick timeline. So hopefully if you're on this uh, session, you already are somewhat familiar with Grails, but just in case to get you up to speed, Grails 1 was released, 1.0 was released in 2008 and uh, Grails at that time was really sort of a, a, a uh, a wrapper over Spring uh, for for MVC and for dependency injection, Hibernate for persistence, Site Mesh for views, and it was all kind of bound together using Groovy and using a lot of Groovy metaprogramming to provide a really uh, powerful development experience for Java developers. And so it was a very exciting framework, it still is, of course. Grails 2 was released in 2011 and uh, was a, a, a a breaking upgrade, but largely continuing along the same lines. But then Grails 3 was where things changed quite a bit. So with Grails 3, uh, the framework became based on Spring Boot, which was released uh, uh, previously, of course. It also moved to Gradle as a, as a uh, build system, build tool, uh, which was a shift from the more custom build system that was used in previous versions of Grails. And there were a lot of breaking changes. No plugins could work initially. All plugins needed to be upgraded. And unfortunately, a lot of folks, their experience with Grails upgrade, when they think of upgrading to a new version of Grails, a lot of folks are still thinking of the Grails 2 to Grails 3 um, uh, migration, which was uh, very painful for a lot of people, simply because it was really a, a complete uh, re-architecture, a completely new architecture, you know, based on Spring Boot, which had a lot of benefits and allows uh, Grails 3 and up to take advantage of a lot of the cool features available in Spring Boot and in modern versions of Spring but it was a, a, a painful process for some. Uh, Grails 4 was, was released in uh, 2019, so just last year, and uh, new releases are still being made. So Grails 4 is a, a, a major upgrade. However, and we're gonna talk about this a little bit more, it is not anything comparable to going from Grails 2 to 3. It's still based on Spring Boot. It's going to the latest version of Spring Boot, still based on the same foundational libraries, with the one exception being the addition of Micronaut to that uh, foundation. So the Micronaut um, integration, which we'll talk about later on, 
it's probably the big biggest ticket item uh, when you're upgrading to Grails 4. Grails 4.1, uh, the second milestone was just released a week ago. So Grails is still being actively developed, uh, largely by OCI, as well as other contributors in the community that we're extremely grateful for. And uh, yeah, so uh, check out the latest milestone and, and uh, the release notes to see what's coming up. I believe at least one of the things happening is uh, looking to move to Groovy 3 uh, for Grails 4.1, is my understanding. So uh, stuff is still happening. So what's new in Grails 4? Uh, one of the big changes was that Java 8 is now the minimum. That was something that was kind of holding uh, Grails 3 back a little bit and that we still supported older versions of Java. With Grails 4, Java 8 is the minimum. And um, I believe I believe we've tested at least through Java 11, if not uh, higher by now. Um, I think I've only used Java 11 uh, myself. But uh, Groovy 2.5.6 is the uh, current uh, shipping version of Groovy uh, with Grails 4. Spring Boot 2, Spring 5. So you can see it's largely just up, upgrading to the latest major version of these core uh, frameworks that underpin Grails 3. Um, Gradle 5, uh, which was a fairly major upgrade from Gradle 3 that was being used in Grails 3, uh, upgrading uh, up, uh, upgrading to the uh, later version of Spock, and then, of course, the Micron integration. Now, fundamentally, a Grails app is a Spring Boot app. Um, if you're using Grails you and you're migrating from, essentially, you're migrating from Spring Boot 1 to Spring Boot 2, um, you can take advantage of a lot of the, uh, the content available on how do you do that upgrade. Uh, when, when it comes to upgrading your Grails project to Grails 4, because uh, a lot of things uh, are essentially the, the, the same steps are needed when it comes to migration. Um, so be, be sure to look into, and we'll talk about this as well as we go on, but, but look into the uh, content available for upgrading to Spring Boot 2. It will largely be, there will be things that will be applicable to you. Uh, so as I already said, Grails to the Grails upgrade from 3 to 4 should not be considered equivalent in the level of effort and in the complexity of the upgrade from Grails 2 to Grails 3. Largely that's because it's still based on the same underlying frameworks, Spring Boot, uh, Hibernate, and so forth. Um, and the, it's still based on Gradle, right? So a, a big, whenever I've done it, whenever I do a upgrade from Grails 2 to 3, or now even to 4, the, probably one of the hardest changes is going from this completely new project structure, right? So you have to replace your build config.groovy with a Gradle file. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about that uh, right now, actually. So because I know there are probably some folks listening that are using an even older version of Grails than Grails 3, um, just some words of advice. It, it's, it's, not, it, it's not an easy migration. At the same time, it's not impossible. <laughs> um, and one good way to think of it is that you really are migrating to a new framework, uh, even though there's going to be a, a lot of things that will stay the same, a lot of your domain classes will largely stay the same. A lot of your controllers will largely stay the same, but there are some things to be aware of. Um, you do wanna read the release, the upgrade notes for Grails two to three, as well as the upgrade notes from three to four. Uh, I would recommend if you are coming from uh, below Grails three, um, I would recommend going all the way to four um, because the, the, the amount of changes necessary to go from three to four are minor enough that if you're gonna go through the, the trouble of that kind of an upgrade, uh, there's not really a lot to be gained by going to three and then and, and then doing three to four later on. Um, of course, you know your preferences may differ, but that's just my uh, having done that kind of an upgrade. That's my recommendation. Uh, when you're moving to Gradle, just think your build config.groovy file is sort of being supplanted by your build.gradle file, and so your dependencies and repositories are going to be um, you know specify there. I mean, you're, you're going to want to you're going to want to want to learn Gradle, of course, to, to make this all work. And one trick that I found useful for any version of Grails, really, and uh, this works great if you're using Git. And if you're not using Git, I might suggest you use it just for this purpose, um, because what you can actually do is you can uh, check in your project, your Grails 2 or 3 project into a Git repository, um, commit it, delete it, replace it with the target version of Grails, Grails 4 uh, in this case, and then what you can do is you can now do diffs to figure out, okay, what configuration changed. You can immediately pull in all of your own custom code, all your controllers and services that aren't directly affected by the upgrade necessarily. Um, but then you can compare line by line and see, okay, this configuration key changed, these imports changed. It's a helpful way to make sure you're getting, you, you make sure you see exactly what differs between the latest version and whatever your source version happens to be. Um, we won't, won't talk any more about that uh, because we're, we're going to run out of time. Um, 
But uh, one thing to, to note too, uh, if you're using an older version of Grails, you're likely using the resources plugin and you will have to migrate to the asset pipeline to handle your front end assets. There's a really helpful blog post on the OCI Grails team blog from my colleague, Ivan uh, Lopez, that uh, you should check out for insight into doing that. So what to know about going to Grails 4? So anything that was deprecated in Grails 3 uh, largely has been removed. Some packages have been moved around. This is all covered in the uh, upgrade notes, which I have linked here at the bottom. But the good news is that there's no major breaking API changes. So your Grails 3 app, largely not, unless you're doing something particularly interesting, you're probably not going to be negatively affected by the upgrade. You're probably not going to have a lot of breaking changes in your own code. Most plugins should just work. That's awesome. That was probably one of the most painful parts of the Grails 2 to 3 upgrade was the fact that the plugin system was completely different. It was based on this new Spring Boot architecture. So with Grails 4, uh, most plugins should just work unless they're doing something specific that we'll talk about down the road. Um, and there are some breaking changes as well in the underlying framework, Spring, Hibernate, Groovy. We'll look at those in a little bit. Again, unless you're doing something particularly interesting with those frameworks, however, you probably won't have to change a lot of your code to make this upgrade work. So what are the steps to upgrade? Well, first of all, you're gonna to wanna to upgrade your Grails version, which is defined uh, in your gradle.properties file. You're gonna to wanna to look at the uh, uh, the up migration guide for Spring Boot 2. There have been some changes. Again, if you're just using the defaults that Grails gives you and then adding your own code, you're probably not gonna be affected by these. But if you are using Spring Boot features, then you're gonna make sure wanna make sure that you take the necessary migration steps to go to Spring Boot 2, because that's what you are doing uh, when you're using Grails 4. Uh, there's been changes to the embedded container API. I, list, I included a link to a helpful blog post describing that. Um, some, a lot of configuration keys have changed. Again, these are gonna be keys primarily that changed if you're using Spring Boot uh, configuration properties. Um, there also have been changes to the actuator. If you're not familiar with the actuator, it's this cool feature of Spring Boot that gives you things like health endpoints and info endpoints. Uh, to make it easier to manage your application. They can be exposed through JMX. Uh, that configuration, uh, set of configuration properties, the keys have changed in Spring Boot 2 and thus also in Grails 4. Uh, what you see there on the slide is simply the default configuration. If you were to generate a brand new Grails 4 app, which I do recommend, by the way, it is very helpful to have um, a stock Grails 4 app available to, for you, to you as you're doing this upgrade so you can reference uh, what the stock app looks like, a stock project looks like. Um, there's also been changes to the Spring Boot developer tools, um, or rather I should say the Spring Boot developer tools have replaced the older spring loaded, um, hot reloading library. Uh, so one of the cool features of Grails has always been that you can make changes to your controllers and your views and refresh the page, the application, you will actually recompile those, the affected classes and you see your changes at runtime if it works and it doesn't always work. So uh, that's been now been replaced with Spring Boot Developer Tools, which is a little bit less sophisticated, but more reliable. Uh, developer Tools will actually restart your application uh, when changes are detected. As I said earlier, there are, the changes to Spring should not generally affect you unless you're using Spring features uh, outside of the Grails artifacts and the Grails integration. So you'll wanna check out the migration guide for that as well, just to make sure you're not doing anything that, that's uh, gonna be broken. Similarly, same story when it comes to Gradle. Uh, we're going from Gradle, Gradle 3 to Gradle 5 in Grails 4. Uh, that command you see at the bottom there is the minimum command you need just to upgrade your Gradle wrapper to the uh, current version for Grails 4. And you wanna check the release notes there. If you have a lot of custom build tasks, there have been some changes, things like the left shift operators no longer supported uh, when you're uh, creating a task a Gradle task, um, Java 8 minimum requirement, of course. So uh, again, these are things that are not likely to affect you unless you're doing something interesting with these tools. And hopefully if you are, you already will be aware of that and be able to appreciate the migrate migration uh, notes. Um, you will need to change uh, the, in a default Grails, Grails 3 application. There's this add resources property, which no longer exists. And you can see the equivalent in Grails 4 there on the uh, right-hand side of the screen. Similarly, uh, the boot repackage task has been re replaced with either boot jar, if you are creating a runnable jar file with Grails 4, or boot war, if you are creating a war file uh, for deployment to a servlet container. So very minor um, changes. Again, it's little configuration keys or, or properties that have changed. A couple more interesting things come up when we talk about GORM. 
Uh, all operations now require a transaction. That means if you're doing things like uh, you know, book.git from a domain class in a controller, that's not going to work unless you wrap that in a transaction, either using the at transactional annotation or the at read only annotation. Um, there have also been some packages that have been uh, removed that were deprecated, and there's been some uh, uh, restructuring, so some imports may have changed. Those things should be fairly straightforward um, to, to uh, fix, however. There's also been a little bit of a trickier change that I won't go into detail here, but there's been a change in how GORM uh, handles Hibernate proxies. They are no longer automatically unwrapped. And what that means, I'm gonna skip to this example here, is that um, if you are using it, the Java instance of comparator to assert in this case, or, or, or check if, a, if an associated property, right? So if I wanna see if my person.pet is an instance of dog, uh, which it should be in this case, um, that only works if GORM goes out and actually um, up, uh, unwraps the proxy that's being created for that association. Uh, what that means is that in Grails 4, which no longer does that, or rather I should say GORM 7 no longer does that extra bit of unwrapping, uh, if you just use the instance of Java comparator uh, keyword, it's no longer going to uh, work. It's not going to, it, it's it's going to be checking against an instance of this, pro of this hibernate proxy, and it's not going to be the class you expect. The workaround is to use any of the green check mock checkbox um, examples you see down there. Uh, GORM actually provides its own instance of method, which is probably the best way to go, um, because that's actually going to be, allow GORM to um, tell you if, if the associated property is actually of the instance of the class that you're looking for. So this is a little gotcha that most folks won't be affected by, but it's something worth noting. Um, the Grails validation module has been replaced. Um, by Grails data store GORM validation, that's going to result in a, in a bunch of package um, changes to any of the uh, to, to, to the um, various uh, Grails validation constraints. I think I had a, I thought I had an example of that in here, but I don't. But the whole list is available in the release notes that were linked earlier in the presentation. So uh, already mentioned, transactions are now required for all operations. This is mostly going to affect. Uh, controllers, because if you do domain access in your controller and you're not inside previously, um, if you're doing a read operation, you didn't need a transaction. Uh, as of Hibernate 5.2, you, you do need a transaction. And so if you are doing domain access outside of a transactional controller, you need to either annotate the method with at transactional or at read only um, as appropriate in order for that to work. Okay, so still talking about upgrade steps here. Up, obviously, we have to upgrade our GORM version. Notice there was a slight change in how we referenced that. Instead of GORM version uh, camel case, it's now GORM.version. Uh, we also have to upgrade our dependencies for Hibernate. And that is largely it when it comes to the GORM migration. There's not a lot that has to change. Uh, a couple other things, and this is gonna start bringing, this is gonna start segueing us into the Micronaut uh, portion of this talk, which we'll try to go through really quickly. Um, and that is uh, the REST client builder is no longer being uh, supported or developed. So that was a very common way of doing uh, REST uh, interactions in Grails apps. That's no longer being, uh, uh, is no longer recommended. It's been replaced by the Micronaut HTTP client. And so we can see an equivalent example here of, uh, in this example here, we're creating, we got a, U a URI and we're making a put request using basic auth. And this is the equivalent using Micronaut. So, I'm not going to focus on this too much because um, you can you can obviously read the documentation, but also I want to get onto a more interesting way of doing HTTP client uh, stuff uh, using the Micronaut integration. Uh, Asset pipeline bump in the version. Uh, this uh, uh, version three of the Asset pipeline uh, dramatically uh, improves performance and uh, support for newer versions of JavaScript, um, but otherwise doesn't require a major migration. So that's great. Just a dependency up, up update. Uh, with Spring Security Core, things are a little more interesting. Spring Security, obviously, a very common plugin in Grails applications. You have to upgrade the update to the uh, current version for core, but some other things have changed as well. So, for example, uh, it's no longer pot, it's no longer by default. You're no longer able to um, to do dependency injection within domain classes. Domain classes, as of Grails 3.2, I believe, are no longer automatically auto wired. And so that means that code like you see here, which used to be generated by Spring Security when you use the, um, the quick start um, command, it no longer is generated. And so this code here would up, normally would handle the password encoding. Uh, however, now what's done instead is a GORM listener is generated by the Spring Security plugin. 
And that is where we take care of the password encoding. This is a great example, by the way, of writing GORM listeners, which are uh, the recommended way of handling sort of asynchronous persistence operations in recent versions of GORM. And then this just shows how you register that listener. Again, this is code that's provided for you when you create your, uh, your um, project with the S2 Quick Start Guide. Um, some other notes about, uh, so if, uh, if you're, when you're moving to the newer version of Spring Security, you have to upgrade, uh, update your, your stored passwords uh, with this little key that indicates the way that they were encoded. Um, so that's also detailed in the um, links that are down at the bottom. Gonna kind of brush through here, updates to Groovy. Uh, plugins, like I said, should generally work just fine unless you're using a specific API, such as the Grails domain class API, which has been replaced with the persistent ent entity API. And I'm basically out of time, um, but I still have to run through my uh, Micronaut integration. Uh, Soren, what should I do? I'm going to press on uh, real quick here and try to get this wrapped up in a couple of minutes. So I apologize for that. You have until, um, let me see, uh, 40, 50 to the hour. Oh, oh okay, okay, good. <laughs> All right, I was trying too hard. Next session I, is I 55. My... Okay, okay. All right, good. So I still have about 10 minutes or five yes, minutes? Yes, 10 minutes. 10 minutes, okay. All right, so I have my clock, my mental clock on wrong, and I thought that I was out of time. So uh, with that in mind, let me just r quickly, I don't want to, uh, to short sell folks here. Um, actually, Groovy changes, nothing that should really affect most Grails uh, three applications. Um, the biggest one will probably be the, the fact that the date extensions in Groovy, that's the ability to just, like add, use the uh, math operators on dates, right? So new date plus one, things like that are now, they now require the Groovy date util dependency. That's something that might catch you off guard. So just be aware of that. There's no more Groovy all jar, uh, which is actually a good thing because it allows you to just bring in the parts of Groovy that you're actually using. And the date util is one of those parts that you might want to be aware of. Um, as I said previously, the plugin system has not really changed. So the only way that a plugin is going to be broken is going to be if it's using an API that's been changed in one of the underlying frameworks like Spring. Or in a few uh, cases, and these are all covered in the upgrade notes, so I highly recommend you check those out. Uh, the Grails domain class API was a way that you could sort of introspect domain classes and get information about their properties and so forth. You can still do all of that, but you could, the Grails domain class API, which was deprecated, um, is now being replaced with the persistent entity API. And there's, um, there's uh, information in the documentation on how to do the equivalent uh, tasks using the newer API. Okay, let's talk about the Micron integration. So I'm glad we have a few minutes uh, yet because this will take us a few minutes to go through. So uh, hopefully you already know about Micronaut, but just very briefly, it's a, a new library. It's actually its own framework, uh, primarily aimed at building microservices on the JVM. Uh, it supports Groovy as well as Java and Kotlin. And it's really focused on compile time, processing, uh, low memory footprint, high performance, uh, eliminating reflection, eliminating runtime proxies, which we talked about when it came to Hibernate, right? So uh, Micronaut tries to get away from that approach of, of adding uh, uh, framework functionality. It tries to do everything that, need, that, it, that it can at compilation time. And so Micronaut has now been added to that foundational stack. Um, and what it allows us to do is it allows us to actually improve uh, the performance and reduce the memory usage of a Grails application, which is great. But it also allows us to take take advantage of features that are that exist in the Micronaut space within our Grails application. And when it, uh, as a general rule, uh, since Micronaut itself is a framework, it has its own HTTP layer based on Netty. Um, obviously, you're not going to want to use that in a Grails application, right? Grails is still based on the servlet. Um, it's got its own um, MVC. It's got its own controller layer. So you're not going to want to use those parts of Micronaut in a Grails application. However, there's a lot of things that Micronaut provides that are not related to HTTP, you know, serving HTTP requests that can be used within Micronaut. We're gonna talk about those um, right now. Uh, the big one is to, to uh, be able to declare HTTP clients. This slide is mislabeled, apologize for that. It should be Micronaut features, not Micronaut messaging. Um, so the, probably some of the biggest features that, that you'll be interested in, in using will be using Micronaut's declarative HTTP client, using the at client interface. We'll see an example of that. You can also make use of the clients available for various messaging tools like Kafka and Rabbit. 
So there's really great support in Micronaut for those frameworks as well as other messaging systems that are still, um, that support's still being worked on. And you can use all of those natively within a Grails 4 application, which is really cool. And it opens up a lot of interesting possibilities, both in allowing Grails to work in conjunction with other services that are written in Micronaut, as well as simply to be able to take advantage of these features, even if you're not using Micronaut as a, as a standalone framework at all, you can still take advantage of this. And generally speaking, anything you can do in Micronaut, it's going to be a little more, it's going to be more performant than if you did the equivalent thing with um, a, a Grail Spring Boot kind of implementation because of that uh, compile time processing. And uh, so let's see an example here. The HTTP client, we mentioned this earlier, but we just kind of look very briefly at the raw Micronaut HTTP um, API, client API, uh, which is a full featured API. You can do everything you'd expect, set headers, add basic auth, add you know, uh, bearer token auth, all that kind of stuff. Um, but where Micronaut's HTTP client kind of comes into its own is when you actually don't just use the raw API and instead uh, create a declarative client, which we're going to see right now. So here's an example of an API we, that we want to interface with. This is uh, from start.grails.org, which is the Grails project generator. And we can hit the versions endpoint and get back a list of Grails versions that are available. This list is clearly out of date because it doesn't show Grails 4. Um, so let's look at an example of how you would write an HTTP client and use it within Grails to access this endpoint, right? So what we could do is we, would, we can define an interface. And in this case here, we're using a bit of inheritance. So we're defining a top level interface that just declares the um, list string versions method. So this is gonna represent the endpoint we want, we want to call and it gives us the return type that we want to get. So when we call this endpoint, we wanna get back a list of strings that will be the Grails versions that are uh, provided. Obviously we need the HTTP client dependency, uh, which I believe is included by default, uh, at least for testing. I think it is included by default in Grails 4. If not, it's very easy to add. And now what you can do is you can define an interface that's annotated with at client and it's going to then uh, be annotated with various annotations like at get uh, to specify a get request. There's annotations for setting the, the, the uh, expected content type or uh, annotations for uh, you know, inspecting headers and cookies and all, all the things you'd expect from a full featured HTTP client you can do with this declarative annotation based API. Now what's cool is that Micronaut is actually going to generate the HTTP logic to support these operations at compilation time. So there's no runtime analysis that has to happen to create this client. It's already been, it's, it's been inspected, it's been uh, uh, analyzed and generated for you at compilation time. And that has to do with the way that Micronaut uh, works. Um, but now, because we're using this in a Grails 4 application, we want to be able to inject this Micronaut HTTP client into our Grails controller. And, it's as simple as what you see right there, where we use the we're using the auto wire annotation to inject our Grails client, and we can now render it uh, to render out the output from that that method, and we're done. So it's pretty seamless, and it's a, a really powerful uh, feature that that you almost certainly want to make use in Gra in your Grails four applications if you're doing any sort of interaction with other APIs. It's um uh, this declarative, which we're only seeing we're just scratching the surface here with this example. But the declarative API for HTTP clients is really pleasant to work with, and it is more performant than any runtime um, equivalent uh, HTTP client that you might otherwise use. And it's available for you in Grails 4, so definitely worth uh, checking out and seeing if you can replace either your Grail, either your REST client uh, plugin from the older versions of Grails or some other um, REST or HTTP client you might be using. Uh, consider the Micronaut HTTP client uh, when you're working in Grails 4. One thing about the, the HTTP client is that it's uh, natively non-blocking. So if you look at this example here where we have a, a spot uh, integration test, um, you'll see that we actually have to create an instance. Now we're using the, 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 uh, the native HTTP client API, right? So you can use the native API where you say, okay, get a client and create a request and chain all these things together, or you can create a declarative interface. Now I always prefer the interface, but in a test, it might make sense to just use the, the, the raw API since you're not actually gonna reuse this code anywhere else. So this is an example of that, but notice that we have to say to blocking at the end. If you look at that line there where we're creating the client for the server port and so forth, that's because by default, the HTTP client is non-blocking uh, because that's uh, Micron internally uh, uh, works that way. 
However, the cool thing is that when you create an interface like we saw here <clears throat> with this client at client annotation, um, in order to, we don't have to add dot not dot uh, to blocking or anything like that because it's obvious by our return type. We're not returning a reactive type. We could return a completable future. We could return an RX Java type. We could return a non-blocking, uh, a, a reactive type, and then we would get the non-blocking behavior. But in this case, we don't actually want non-blocking behavior. Uh, we don't actually, yeah, we want blocking behavior, which is more typical uh, in, in Grails anyways. And we get that by simply returning a non-reactive type, like list of string. Uh, this example here is actually showing how we can set uh, the URL that we want our client to talk to. So rather than putting the, the whole URL into the annotation, we can set it up in configuration, as you see here, uh, which is a more robust way, of course, of, of setting up your HTTP clients because you can have different URLs for different environments, for development, test, and production. Um, so the HTTP clients uh, from Micronaut is extremely uh, powerful and definitely worth using in your Grails 4 app. Okay, so uh, Micronaut versus Grails. I'm not going to get into a big discussion on this. Just we'll say that Micronaut is a standalone framework uh, that we're very excited about. It's also being developed by the same team that produced Grails, being sponsored by uh, OCI. Micronaut is really optimized for building microservices, as the name might imply. And it's also really, it, it's designed for distributed architectures, right? There are native features in Micronaut that are basically assuming that you are going to be talking to other services and that you need to handle issues like services going down or uh, you want to support features like service discovery. That's all built into Micronaut uh, as a standalone framework. But Micronaut is much more versatile than that. Micronaut can be used um, as a foundational library as it is with Grails 4. It can be used to build CLI applications. It can be used to build Android applications. Uh, Micronaut as a, as a foundational library can be used in any JVM application really to handle things like dependency injection and other features. So Grails, on the other hand, is really based around developer productivity, right? Building applications quickly, and it's 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 still in the monolithic kind of mindset, right? You've got a full stack MVC application that handles everything from database and persistence to the rendering of views, uh, maybe GSPs, maybe JSON. Uh, regardless, it's a full stack framework, whereas Micronaut is more optimized for distributed systems and microservices. So those are some general guidelines when you're trying to decide which way to go. Um, you know, just consider that. Micronaut is really des designed for a distributed system. Uh, Grails is designed for uh, rapid development and productivity, but with more of an emphasis towards monolithic type architectures. Um, one thing to bear in mind, though, especially for those that of us that create Grails plugins, is that because of the Micronaut integration in Grails, uh, uh, Grails now supports the concept of configurations. And in many ways, configurations can be thought of as a replacement for Grails plugins, Micronaut configurations. Configurations are super powerful because they can work with Micronaut, obviously. They can work with Grails, and they can work with Spring. And we're going to see a quick example of how we can do that, actually. Now, there are some features that you can only use, some Grails features that are only accessible via a Grails plugin. Anything involving GSP or JSON views, for example, or tag libs. Those don't exist in any other framework but Grails. They don't exist in Spring Boot. They don't exist in Micronaut. And so if you're using, if those are the kinds of things you have in your plugin, you're going to have to continue building it as a Grails plugin. But if all you're doing is providing some services, uh, some configuration, um, if, 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 you're do, if that's all that your plugin is providing, there's a good chance you could use a Micronaut configuration to do the exact same thing, and you'll have a much more robust and versatile um, uh, plugin, your know, configuration as a result. So let's look at a quick example here. So here is a Grails plugin, right? Which really just provides a Grails service. That's largely all that it's doing, right? And the service, and this simple example here, it's making a SOAP request, right? So we got a Grails plugin with a service, the code doesn't really matter right now, um, that provides uh, some interaction with a, a SOAP API. But this plugin can only be used in Grails, right? doesn't really have any, when it comes to Grails 4, it, it'll work with Grails 4, but let's take a look at what this would look like if we built it as a Micronaut configuration. So you can see all, all the way, it's already, it's quite slimmed down, right? We don't need the Grails app directory. We don't need the views directory. All we need is the code that kind of matters to our configuration, right? So we've got our service, we've got a test. Um, and then what we do in our build.gradle file, of course, this is a Groovy project, and we've got a, a, a dependency on Micronaut inject Groovy. 
And all we have to change in our code is to annotate it with the Java inject singleton. That's how Micronaut does dependency injection. Now that we've done that, we can inject, we can use this library and inject our service into a Grails controller, into a Micronaut controller, and even a Spring Boot application. Um, so here's the injection point, auto wired. And all we have to do is add these two dependencies to our Spring Boot application. Um, you got to wrap it up. All right. Uh, we are basically done. So <laughs> that's Micronaut configurations. Uh, there's much more on the documentation. But in summary, the upgrade process from to Grails 4 completely different world from the upgrade from two to three, much less painful, much easier. Micronaut is a, a, a great addition to the foundation, uh, set of foundation libraries. Um, we do recommend you look at Micronaut configurations as an alternative to plugins. And that's really it. So now we got time for questions. And I think what I'll do is I'm gonna move over to my resources slide and then I will stop my presentation so I can see we got any questions to go through? Okay. You. All right. Okay. Um, can you allow to move their plugins over? Submit plugins. Uh, there's yeah. There's no issue with that. Uh, the plugins uh, website is available. I should probably put that in my list. Um. Is there a place for Micronaut? Okay, so uh, Tucker's asking if there's a place for Micronaut configurations similar to what we have for Grails plugins. Um, that's a good question. I don't think we have one when it comes to community um, su supported uh, ones. That's probably a, 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 a good thing to, uh, to talk about um, at the moment. There's not really any infrastructure for doing that. There are uh, kind of core configurations that are listed on the Micronaut website, on the documentation website. So, uh, so you just go, um, but that would be on, on the Micronaut documentation site, rather, uh, for configurations. Not sure if we have that for um, Grails compatible configurations. And that would be something to be really cool to add maybe in the future to the Grails plugin website to have a, a new tab for uh, Micronaut configuration, you know, plugins. Um, but I'm not aware of that going on right now. Um, let's see. How far out is 4.1 expected for a GA release? I don't have an answer for you on that right now, Tucker, unfortunately. Um, it's being actively worked on, I can tell you that much, but i um, not quite sure what they're uh, targeting for a GA. Okay. And Thank you, Tucker, for sharing some interesting links there with your upgrade experience. And then, yeah, as far as Owen and Soren's discussion, yeah, that's that's correct. The Micronaut, the Micronaut context, so Micronaut is the parent context uh, for Spring Boot. So the Spring Boot dependency injection is still working. There's just a mapping that allows the the allows beans from the two different contexts to interact with each other, um, which is super cool. And am I missing anything else, Soren, as far as any? Why do we need Micronaut? Well, uh, that's not this talk. <laughs> um, I think uh, we have a talk coming up on on uh, Micronaut from uh, Soren Delamo. And um, I'll be talking about Micronaut and Groovy as well uh, right afterwards uh, later, later today. So this is a... Rails for Why is auto wire needed for Micronaut beans? Um, so that's simply to uh, that's to inject them. Um, so the uh, that the the mapping between the Micronaut. My understanding is it's the mapping between the Micronaut beans and um, the Spring dependency context. Micronaut's basically looking for that auto wire uh, dep uh, dependency to or auto wire annotation. Sorry to make that injection. And yep, Soren says we just got one minute left. So thank you all for joining. I'm gonna put up my contact information uh, real quick. If you've got any questions, um, feel free to hit me up by either email or Twitter. Um, my GitHub link is there as well. Um, and check out, uh, of course, our website, objectcomputing.com.
And thank you all for uh, attending. Thank you for your attention. This has been thank fun. Thank you for your time. That was very nice. All right. Thank you, Soren. I'll see you guys all later. See you around.